Do you know what Area 941 is? It's kpfa.org's new podcasting space. This allows us to expand our programming with more on-demand programs so you can listen when you want or download them at any time. Area 941 is just another reason why people say, I heard it on KPFA. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. It's 3.30. Up next, A Rude Awakening. is a rude awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll speak to Greenpeace activist Nancy Bealey Hernandez on her experience climbing a 270-foot crane in front of the White House to hang a 70-foot sign and her subsequent arrest. And longtime activist and teacher Yvette Falarca will be reporting back on the protests at SFO this weekend over Trump's ban on Muslims. Stay tuned. On January 25th, Greenpeace activists, seven Greenpeace activists unfurled a 70 foot by 35 foot sign right next to the White House that said resist. One of those seven activists did a Facebook live stream of the whole event. And her name is Nancy Hernandez. She is on the line to speak with us about uh, is the sign still up, what she went through, because she did get arrested. Talk to us about what happened, Nancy. Welcome to the show. Hello, and it's um, it's great to be on the airwaves on KPFA. I'm very happy to be back in the Bay Area. Um, I was in Washington D.C. for this action, and recently just got back to got back home. So I'm very happy to be able to talk to you and to all the listeners out there in um, in KPFA Landia. All right. Now it was a 270 foot construction crane. Um, I watched the uh, Facebook live clip three times and I tell you, it was just, (laughs) it was so empowering, so empowering. Do you have a fear of heights? I'm 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 scared of heights, and I'm also scared of Facebook live feeds. That was my first live feed. I didn't know what I was doing, but I watched um, a bunch of my friends who were out at Standing Rock using that as a tool to get their message across. And so we tried it, and uh, it got over a million views. Over a million, and a million more to come. A million more to come. Now, 270 foot construction crane in downtown Washington. Now it faces. Uh, give us an idea of the. Um, of the layout now it faces the uh the white house is that correct yeah when you're if you're standing in front of the white house and you look at the white house uh the banner that we dropped was directly above and to the right so had the um had donald been in office that day he would have looked out of his window and seen this huge banner um proclaiming that the people will be resisting every one of his policies that he proposes to divide us. Um, There were pictures tweeted out from the press room at the White House where you can see the banner from their door. Um, now, he's he's signed executive orders, and in the last couple of days, or actually in the last week or so, well, actually about five days ago, on Wednesday, he signed orders for uh, the, the the banning of Muslims from seven different countries. We'll be talking about that later uh, with another guest on A Rude Awakening. But let's talk about what happened to you. Now, you were up on this crane. You, you, you unfurled this amazing sign along with your comrades. Um, what happened once you guys got down? Um, so definitely shout out to Solange for her soundtrack. We played Cranes in the Sky on the Descend. It was beautiful. We played um, Kendrick Lamar on the way up. So definitely uh, music was one of the things that kept us um, grounded and rooted and calm and uh, focused on what we were doing. So um, on the way down, we um, well, we were able to pack up everything. We had to clean up all of the rigging and gear that we used. We did not want to uh, put anyone else 
else's life at risk. So we did not want any situation where they would need to send a crew up to clean up any of our, um, you know, gear or things that we use. So we cleaned everything up. We actually cleaned up some of their mess as well while we were up there. Um, and so we lowered down the banner and lowered down a bunch of our gear. And then we climbed down the 10 stories into, um, the waiting arms of the police department, uh, we were then booked and uh, taken to jail. We spent about 18 hours in jail, um, and then we were given a court date and released. All right. So how were you treated? How were you treated by, by, the, uh, by the cops? So I would say the first batch of cops had been waiting around for a long time, so they were aggressive and upset. They uh, tightened our handcuffs to the point where my hands turned purple and I couldn't even turn a doorknob. Um, so in the beginning, those officers were upset. But once we got into the jail, the officers had been watching the news. And so everybody we interacted with pretty much inside of the jail um, knew who we were. And we got high fives. We got props. We got, um, you know, a lot of officers saying that they don't believe that this man is a legitimate president. Uh, we were told we should do the Capitol building next. Uh, we were told by large officers, you know, big men, that they were too scared to have done anything like that, and they thought we were fearless. Uh, we also spent a lot of time in holding cells with other prisoners or other, or other um, cellmates, and I think that uh, it's definitely a grounding and humbling situation to be um, put into um, a cell with other women and hear their stories. Uh, we were, I think there was about 16 women whose stories we heard of all the different things that they were incarcerated for. So much of it having to do with violence that had been enacted against them by men. Um, so much of it had to do with petty things. Like one woman was in jail the same amount of time that we were for a dollar 82 metro fare, um, that she uh, evaded and she was arrested for. So, uh, being in, jail for 18 hours definitely reaffirmed within me once again that the prison industrial system needs to be abolished and that there is a huge injustice taking place within our jail systems all right and thank you for thank you for definitely stating that uh just want to let everybody know whoever has not been to uh, washington dc it's a predominantly black city unincorporated city now let's see here the it was 15th and L Street Northwest, and this sign disrupted traffic, among other things. Um, and now, how do you feel about what you've done in general? Would you do it again? Talk to us about how you're feeling right now with this court case looming. Well, I, I definitely felt scared as it was happening. You know, I was afraid that my legs wouldn't make it up that high. I was scared that I wouldn't be able to do it. But um, I definitely felt inspired by the younger people in my life um, and a lot of them that are currently facing situations where they are also afraid. A lot of my students um, have fear that their families will be deported or they will be separated from their parents. Um, a lot of the families that I work with uh, have fear about, you know, the security of their future and the security of, I guess, all of our future under this administration. Um, so I really tried to um, focus uh, my overcoming of my fears in a way that I could hopefully pass that on to people um, who are going to be going through the, the uh, however long he's allowed to stay in office. I think people will be feeling these types of fears, and I was hoping that we could send out a message that, um, you know, unity and um and being connected together are uh, one of the ways that we can overcome fears. And we definitely were tied together as a group of people that climbed up onto that crane. Our safety was interconnected. And um, that, I think, is, a, is definitely a microcosm for the rest of the ways that we have to live our lives in this society. Uh, all of our communities, Muslim, Latino, queer, African-American, white, we're, we're all very connected. And um, so I think the group of people that were selected to participate in this action are representatives of, of all of the communities that are under attack. Um, and I think that this was um, a, a proclamation that we will not just accept injustice, but that um, as our communities come under attack, we will band together and we will fight back. All right. You heard it here first. Nancy Peely Hernandez, Greenpeace activist, former programmer here at KPFA. We truly appreciate you taking the time and, and talking to us and, and inspiring us to resist. Nancy Peely Hernandez, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. Thank you so much and much love to KPFA and all the supporters out there. I'm very honored to be um, one of you and I'm very uh, excited about all the actions to come. This land is your land.
Saturday, thousands, thousands of people, thousands of protesters demonstrated at San Francisco International Airport against the ban against folks that are originating from Muslim countries. There is a list of seven that Donald Trump uh, signed an executive order. Those countries include, once again, you've probably already heard this, but you're going to hear it again, Iraq, Syria, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. He has been banning these folks from co- coming into the country, regardless of them having a green card, being legal green card holders, and in some cases even being citizens. And here to talk about it, we've got Yvette Falarka. She is back on the air on the KPFA airwaves. Yvette, you're a longtime activist. Uh, you've been dealing with your own struggles and overcome them, uh, dealing with fascists back in June. And here you are, one of the leaders of a huge demonstration on Saturday and on Sunday. Thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening. It is a complete honor to have you. Thank you, Sabrina. I'm so glad to be back. Yes, I'm so glad I was able to chase you down because you <laughs> You're a hard lady to catch up with for good reason. So we've got under-reporting from uh, from news outlets like KGO um, saying there was 600, there was 700. Oh, the protest started on the, the Friday, but this is, you know, it just erroneous, erroneous stuff. You were there. Talk to us about what happened uh, on Saturday. Well, I was there on Saturday. When I got there, maybe there were 600 who were first, who were there initially. But once we went inside the airport and took over and started occupying the arrival section and the baggage claim area, or I don't even know the baggage claim, but, you know, the arrivals part of the inside, more and more people started coming. And I would say easily between people who came and people who had to go and take shifts but were there. At the biggest point on Saturday, I, would, I guessed it was way over a 1,000. I would guess even 1,500. And then by Sunday, it was huge. I mean, it was just huge because we had taken over both the upstairs and the downstairs late Saturday night. And so then by Sunday, we had taken over both the upstairs and the downstairs of the international terminal at SFO. My goodness, my goodness. Now, so with the situation, uh, SFO officials were given little information about the executive order. I've made attempts to try and find the executive order. I didn't actually go to the White House, uh, White House uh, website or anything like that, but I want to read it for myself. Um, folks are concerned. These officials are concerned about the pace that this is going. It's going so quickly. Um, talk to us about what you saw transpire. Um, the, inf- the sudden influx of the lawyers, the ACLU, National Lawyers Guild, people coming down to, to volunteer their services to, to help these folks and give them legal advice. Um, how long did it take from when the, 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 the protests started to when more support started to come in the form of legal assistance? Well, I, the, the first person who I know of who was released on Saturday night was released at 9.30 p.m. At least that's a report I have. I mean, I could be off on that. But it was 
clearly because of the protests and the demonstrations. And that was true all over the country. You know, it is, it's the movement responding to Trump and his arrogance and his racism and Muslim bashing and immigrant bashing and responding in kind and saying, no, not today. We're not going to let you start implementing and enforcing fascism in the U.S. today. You may have cheated your way into the presidency for now, but this movement is not going to function business as usual. We're going to get him out by any means necessary. That means resisting him, and that means obstructing and disrupting everything he tries to do. So for him to start getting the Homeland Security and Customs and Border Enforcement officers to start holding people from Muslim countries and keeping them from their families, like holding them as if they're prisoners in airports here in this country, I'm just so proud and so happy that there was just thousands of people, not just in San Francisco, but across the nation who stood in solidarity and people across the world who totally supported what we were doing. So we got people freed this this weekend. I think the protests, the movement really did that. And it was the movement making this fight. This wasn't led by any politician. This isn't a movement that's building on the basis of being co-opted by the Democrats who laid the groundwork for all of this to begin with. <laughs> this is this is really the movement of people who are standing up for immigrant rights, for the rights of Muslims and their freedom, for the rights of women, for the rights, rights of LGBT folks, and really for the future of democracy in this country to stop Trump and to get him out. I know that's right. Yeah, it's kind of funny though because uh there was a lot of uh, a lot of these uh lawmakers and uh Democrats mostly uh that uh, tried to join in and tried to co-op. They actually came down. Uh let's see your congressman Eric Swalwell, Swalwell, Swalwell uh came down and and uh it, who else came down? Talk to us about that. <laughs> we heard Saturday night that Gavin Newsom had showed up and, you know, everyone, everyone was, there's a lot of people very happy he was there. It's better that he's there supporting us than not. But nobody felt like he was in any way or treated him like he was a leader because he wasn't. And there was a number of us who were there who were like, we don't want to hear him speak. And we're also booing him because obviously the Democratic Party has just been, they've laid the groundwork for Trump and for the things that Trump is doing, whether it was deporting like, record numbers of immigrants or privatizing public education, including here in California, then no, this is, we were not going to even go down that direction. And so I'm just really glad that in the end, the bottom line is what any of those politicians do is going to be set and determined by the strength and the militancy of the movement now the direct actions that we take, the obstruction that we take. And I'm just so, so excited and proud to be a part of this movement and for the fact that people are just standing up and that we're mobilizing and fighting. Okay, so let's see here. Trump has said on Sunday he released a statement saying, America is a proud nation of immigrants and we will continue to show compassion to those fleeing oppression, but we will do so while protecting our own citizens and border. America has always been the land of the free and home of the brave. We will keep it free and keep it safe, as the media knows, but refuses to say. <laughs> God, this guy is just woo he's full of crap one more thing i want to read real quick and i want to kind of switch gears because we've got davos davos this woman who is a pro privatization of education uh who's going to be confirmed very shortly here in the next couple of days so hold off on that just want to re read this real quick statement from sfo san francisco international airport we appreciate all those who have so passionately expressed their concerns over the president's executive order relating to immigration we share these concerns deeply as our highest obligation is to the millions of people from around the world whom we serve. And that's just a short quote. Uh, you can go to Twitter, Matt Keller, at Matt Keller, ABC7, and read that. Um, I think it's important for folks to realize that customs officials, uh, officials at the airport, um, they're not on the side of this executive order. Now... Let's talk about this Davos woman. I don't even know her first name. I don't think I need to. Um, 
What in how are you? How is your group? How is uh, by any means necessary a uh, coalition, a uh, faction, if you would? Um, how are they? How are they reacting? How are they galvanizing people to stand up against this uh, this woman who is going to be confirmed and is all about privatization of education? So we're gonna. Um De- Betsy DeVos is her name, or Betsy DeVos, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but <laughs> she's a privatizer, and she's the person that Donald Trump's trying to appoint as Secretary of Education. And so we have equal opportunity now by any means necessary, Eon BAM caucus. We have our caucus in the CTA and the CFT. And so at the CTA last weekend in Los Angeles, and of course with the backdrop of LAX, you know, being totally occupied and Thousands of people marching around the entire airport, blocking yes. all lanes of traffic. Yes, and every, I mean it was wild at, at LAX. I mean it was wild. Within that context, it meant then that our caucus members, that BAM, was really able to lead a whole movement from the delegates from the ground up at the CTA convention to vote an emergency response um, resolution to call for a statewide day of action to stop Trump's attacks on public education, including stopping DeVos and stopping her appointment, as well as to defend immigrants. And the date has not been set yet, but I promise you, if that date isn't set in the next 24 to 48 hours, we're just going to have to set it ourselves. But we have, clearly we have the power. I mean, we have power, and the movement has always had power, and we're showing that now. And we're showing it by finally not just relying and hoping that it's going to be Clinton or Bernie or, you know, Barack Obama or any of those Democrats, that it's got to be us and that we've got to take that power and assert it ourselves. All right. Laying the groundwork for a revolution. Here it comes. Here it comes. Get ready for it. I tell you, I mean, if he keeps pushing the way that he is pushing... I don't know. I'm I'm scared, really, to tell you the truth, Yvette. I'm I'm kind of scared. I don't want to see any bloodshed. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, no. Well, it it is a scary time, and it's why it's absolutely why Bam has been calling for making clear like we can't have business as usual until until Trump's defeated, and that he's got to go by any means necessary. That means we do have to defend ourselves, and that is absolutely urgent because the people that he that are backing him, the people he's giving a green light to, the people who he is now sounding more like in terms of the far right wing and the fascist, Mm -hmm. he is leading a fascist movement now in this country. He is taking what he's doing straight from the playbook of not just Steve Bannon, but also Vladimir Putin and also not just and not just the neo fascist, but even classic fascism with Hitler. And that is not an exaggeration. That is not not hyperbole. No, And so we've got to be super serious and we are calling an emergency, like a solidarity protest today at Berkeley at 5 o'clock on mm-hmm. Sproul Plaza okay. in solidarity with the protest that took place in the, in the airport over the weekend and to make sure that we are stopping and defeating Trump's executive orders altogether and getting him out because he's trying to create a police state. We've got to fight that. We've got to stand up for immigrants and Muslim people. We have the power to do that. And if there's any place, and I say this over and over and I'll keep saying it, if there's any place where we can provide a model leadership, which I'm so proud that we were able to do together with New York on Saturday around getting the detainees from the Muslim countries freed, it's absolutely the Bay Area. And we can get set into motion and continue to maintain the motion of getting more people to take mass direct action and really fight by any means necessary, including the shutdowns of the airports like what we saw last weekend. Most definitely. Most definitely. UC Berkeley, UC Berkeley, Sproul Plaza, 5 p.m. today. Uh, you can go and get more information and um, help strategize, be a part of the movement, be a part of this resistance. The theme today, this week, and forever and always, resist, resist, resist. You have There's one other thing. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. You go right ahead. Just one other thing I want to announce is that we are calling for everybody everyone Mm -hmm. to come out on Wednesday to UC Berkeley at 5 o'clock at the MLK Student Union in the Poly Ballroom Mm -hmm. to shut down the racist, sexist Trump ally. Mm -hmm. His name is Milo Yiannopoulos, is what he calls himself. Mm -hmm. And he is an editor of Breitbart News. He's a, you know, colleague of Steve Bannon. He's a white supremacist. He's a total transphobic basher and 
absolute harasser and assaulter as well as totally absolutely racist every time he speaks he gives a green light to explicitly transphobic sexist and racist attacks on the college campuses and he's trying to do a tour of different campuses in california now students at uc davis and protesters at uc davis succeeded uh-huh. in getting him shut down with a, within half an hour when he was supposed to speak. Mm-hmm. And he, ha- he was forced to cancel his speech at UCLA that was supposed to take place later on this week. But at UC Berkeley, that his appearance has not yet been canceled. And we want to make sure that we get everyone up to shut him down by any means necessary, that we're there to do that starting at 5 p.m. And if the administration doesn't shut him down or have to cancel him before... We will do it ourselves. We will not let him take that stage. So we urge everybody to join us for that. There's a lot of people who are organizing for that, and BAM's organizing to shut him down. All right, and that's Wednesday. That's going to be February 1st, 5 p.m. MLK uh, building. And UC Berkeley, at UC Berkeley, shut down Milo. Yvette Falarka, thank you so much for letting folks know about these uh, very important events. And uh, thanks for reporting back on your experience in these last couple of days at SFO. Thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening once again. Thank you, Sabrina. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Big thank you to my guests, Nancy Pili Hernandez and Yvette Falarka for taking the time. The lovely Erica Bridgman is on the controls. I'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Hard Rock Radio is up next. Have a great week, everybody. Take a stand. Resist. And thanks for listening. What Donald Trump represents is the the hateful antithesis of all that Obama worked for, even on an aspirational level, what he saw as a visionary. KPFA presents Michael Eric Dyson, professor, ordained minister, New York Times bestselling author. He's one of our most important public intellectuals. Join us in Oakland on Tuesday, February 7th, 7.30 p.m. at First Congregational Church, 2501 Harrison Street. Join the discussion of his new book, Tears We Cannot Stop, A Sermon to White America. This KPFA benefit has free parking and wheelchair access. I'm Quincy McCoy, GM of KPFA, proud to be hosting Michael Eric Dyson. Tickets available at brownpapertickets.com, Marcus Books, and other indie bookshops. Book it February 7th for Michael Eric Dyson. Tears We Cannot Stop. See you there. This is Philip Mulderry, host of The Sunday Show. Join me and my guests every Sunday morning, 9 to 11. We'll be talking about politics. We'll be talking about the state of things around us. Plus, we open the phones to your called in questions and comments. That's every Sunday morning, The Sunday Show on community-powered KPFA. KPFA.